Uh, thank you everybody for coming to the city council meeting on September 10th, 2024. Um, this public meeting of the city council is recorded on Zoom with a link is posted on the agenda. If you are calling on the phone, you can press star nine to press speak. If you're watching on a computer or a device, there's a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak. Please use either of these options during oral communications to recognize to speak. If technical difficulties arise and the Zoom link is interrupted during an in-person hybrid meeting of a city council and a quorum is present, the meeting may continue after efforts have been made to reestablish that link. The minutes shall be shall note the interruption. It is the finding of the city of Gloucester that no individual should be denied equal treatment or opportunity because of their age, ancestor or color, disability, including intellectual and developmental mental disability, family status, immigration status, gender identity or expression, military status, marital status, national origin, race, religion, sex or sexual orientation. Uh, tonight in attendance, we have um, with us, we have uh, Councilor Jason Grow, Marjorie Grace, Dylan Benson, Val Gilman, Scott Memhard, myself, Frank Majota, absent is Tony Gross, and Jeff Worthley. We have Joe Rosa, Gabby White, um, Dominique, uh, our mayor. Greg Berger. In remote, we have Connor and Kenny and Jill. And I believe Council Worthley has just joined us. So I think that covers that. Um, at this time, I'd like to call for a flag salute in a moment of silence. And the flag salute will be led by Councilor Grace. Congratulations. To the flag of the United States of America and to the, the republic, republic for which, which stands, stands one nation under god indivisible liberty and justice for all. for all all right tonight our moment of silence is going to be for the hungry it's going to be for the people of cape ann that rely on the open door it is hunger aware awareness month um, i want people to think about the things they can do to help such as buy one get one free if you have something available that you're not going to eat in time for it to expire, to always think about the open door in any way that you can help. Some of us may sit here tonight and have a meeting and wonder, you know, we haven't eaten yet and we're hungry. Now imagine that for days on end. And I'd like to keep that in your minds while we do this moment of silence and to thank the Cape Ann Open Door. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, Madam Clerk. Oral communications. Uh, the public shall have the opportunity at every regular scheduled meeting to be heard under oral communications on matters not appearing on the agenda. Oral communication shall allow any resident and or property owner and or business owner who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to city business to appear before the, the council. Make their statement without debate and the city council will refer matters to the office of the mayor. First, speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes each. Thank you. Is there anybody like to speak under oral communications? Do we have any raised hand signs? All right, hearing none, I'd like to close the oral communications. Uh, next order of business, Madam Clerk. A presentation, um, a Board of Health update on beach testing and results interpretation. Good evening, counselors. Um, thank you for recognizing uh, the, the Hunger Awareness Month. It's very important to all of us. Um, tonight, you're going to have a presentation from our uh, health department and our chair of the Board of Health about the beach testing. Uh, this dates back to my earliest days and many of us who started three years ago 
in city government, um, at least for me, a second time in city government. But there were some issues with the beach. We hired a consultant, sorry, the creek. We hired a consultant. We had a report. Um, and contrary to what some uh, narrative has been out there, we did not ignore this report. The report came back and it did not say, here's your problem, here's your solution. But there were other suggestions and uh, we've been taking steps over the last several years, uh, three years, and um, you'll hear that from our crew here. Uh, tonight you'll be hearing from our director, health director, Dominique Hurley, uh, the assistant director, Gabrielle White, uh, board of Ch health chair, Joe Rosa, and also with us is Bree Turco, the senior health inspector, who will be available to answer any questions if needed. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dominique to kick things off. Oh, sorry, to Joe Rosa to kick things off. Good evening, councillors. Um, for the record, my name is Joe Rosa, 26 Fort Hill Ave in Gloucester, uh, and I'm here uh, as uh, chair of the Board of Health. Um, as I hope you're all aware, the state mandates testing of all bathing beaches in Massachusetts and leaves it up to the towns and cities to do that, and for good reason. It's, um, it's not healthy to be exposed to uh, any sort of fecal matter and worse, worse uh, than that, human fecal matter. Uh, and so that's what the testing is meant to, to elucidate, whether or not there is uh, bacteria or viruses of human origin in uh, our bathing waters. Um, we've been doing those testings now for many, many years. And of late, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, the major beaches in Gloucester, Wingersheek and Good Harbor, have been uh, stellar performers, uh, never having been closed uh, in the last years. Uh, that's not the case all over the state. There are many big beaches that attract a lot of tourists that have been closed because of uh, failure to meet, <clears throat> to meet the standards. Excuse me. <clears throat> However, uh, in Gloucester, the smaller beaches and especially uh, the, the incidents that we're going to talk about tonight, Good Harbor Beach Creek, has, has failed a number of times. And um, we're not going to present tonight a, the identification of uh, the smoking gun, because we don't have that yet. We're, we're, we, the department, um, has been working very hard to, uh, one, identify the issues around, get a better understanding of what the nature of the bacteria that are causing the closures, uh, and then where they're coming from. And I think you'll hear a bunch of data uh, this evening that, that gets a, goes a long way as to answering those questions. And once we have a good idea of that, we'll, have, we'll be able to come up with better solutions, better attempts at a solution uh, to the problem. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Director Dominique Hurley, who's going to begin telling you the story. Tell you the facts. <laughs> um, give me one moment while I can share my video and also my screen. Can you all see that well? Okay, great. So thank you, Mayor Verga, for the kind introduction. And thank you, um, Chairman Rosa, for uh, all of the help that you've been um, giving us throughout this year as we have been uh, you know, working very hard to create a data and fact-based approach to the testing and analysis for Good Harbor Beach Creek, as well as all the other beaches in the city of Gloucester. I thought I'd uh, start tonight by telling you, uh, you know, what we have uh, learned I just have to make this listen to me. There we go, what we learned in 2023. So first of all, what we did to start, you know, I'm new to the department as of a year ago almost, um, started at the end of August last year, so at the end of the beach season. And uh, when I came into the department, I was looking at all of our operations, um, but this one of course is front and center since we had just finished. And so to work on that, we looked at all of our past seasons data, we looked at our operations and how we operate, um, we looked at public perception of how we're doing, as well as um, the questions that we um, seem to always have from the public and, and trying to do a great job of responding to. 
And we came up with four key things that are really pretty important for you all to understand. The first is that geo means, which Bree Turco will talk a little bit more about later on, um, are a big reason why our beaches are staying closed longer. And it's important to understand that although our beach uh, exceedances um, quickly correct because of our tidal, the tidal nature of, of the beach, the geo means actually um, can amplify a perceived problem in closure. And that's a state regulation. And again, uh, Bree will talk with you more about that. Um, tides influence um, the the data values that we get from Good Harbor Creek. And if we take it at a high tide versus a low tide, uh, mid tide, um, we could get differing results. Um, we also heard quite clearly that we need to have a quicker time frame between when we get the results and when the public knows. There's a lot of um, comments that came in from the public about how we might post on social media, but the sign wouldn't be updated until two hours later. And that's primarily because of our inspectors' other duties. Um, but we, it's something we worked on for this year. Uh, and then of course, the big one is that the public needs more information. They need more information in terms of how we approach things, um, what the results are, how to interpret the results. And uh, really, um, that was probably one of the biggest things that came out is that we really need to be more um, forthcoming with communications um, surrounding the testing that we do and the results. So we came up with three key objectives around one key goal as we looked at this problem. Our goal being we want to improve the transparency, the accuracy, and the understanding of beach testing and results analysis. It's a pretty easy goal to make, but how would we approach it? These three key objectives came out, um, testing, uh, transparency, and, and data. So the first objective, testing, um, you know, just to help you orient on this graphic, we're looking on the left-hand side at what our, the name of our strategy is and on the right-hand side with what those elements might be that we tackled. Um, so we wanted to ensure consistency and accuracy in testing and response, um, have that be a given in any of the work that we do. So what did that entail? We tested consistently this year at Good Harbor Creek at mid-tide um, as, as often as possible. And I think we, we pretty much hit 100% on that one. And, um, and that was so that we could be sure that whenever we had a result, we could compare that result to the week before and the week before that and have a, a nice clean data trend on exactly what those numbers were. Um, we also added um, preemptive closures, which you'll hear more about again when, when Bree's talking about the results for this year um, after rain and tide events. And that's because um, of this geo mean that gets driven, it's a state mandate. Um, a single test result on day one can be high. The result on day two, because of tide in and out, is fine. But because the geo mean, which is a trend over five days, has to be below X, um, I think it's th in the 30s um, per 100 mLs, um, oftentimes we see beach closures stay longer. So in talking to the Department of Public Health about that at the state level, they advised us that many other communities that are on the coast um, actually preemptively close so that they're protecting the health and safety of the people, but then they open as soon as possible um, uh, after the next test, which would be our next day. So you really have a two-day closure rather than what could be a 10-day closure. And we'll talk to you a little bit today about why exceedances happen and why the numbers get so high so quickly. Um, so hopefully at the end of this um, session, you'll have some more understanding of why a preemptive closure is a good thing. Uh, also, as we're doing across the entire department right now, is we're looking really hard at um, documenting, training, and making sure that we're all following standard operating procedures. That sounds very fancy, but what it allows is that we can have any member of our department um, flex to have to cover for another member who might be handling um, something else. We're a small department. Things come up. We want to be responsive to the community, but we can't miss on this one. So. Um, establishing formal training on how we do it. Um, I even did it. In fact, the picture of the person spreading their arms was me at the beach <laughs> this summer, um, uh, you know, actively going out there and, and performing testing as well. So that was very important to be sure that we are, uh, again, consistency um, in those efforts. Um, we also uh, really focused on providing transparency and reporting, making sure that any result that we have, positive or negative, is posted immediately. You'll see it on social media. I know the mayor's office, the administration has been really helpful in making sure those results go out. And instead of, as in past years, saying, hey, go to this website and you can check out the results, this year proactively we're saying they're open, they're closed, they're open here, but these are, you know, these are closed and trying to be more clear with the public about um, what to do with the results that we're posting. And um, speeding up time to post both physical um, with the beach postings themselves, as well as on social media. I hope you've seen some improvements in that. Um, we certainly are opening and closing in sync, um, which is as soon as we get the word. And, um, and then we further um, have more work to do on that front, which you'll hear about a little bit later. Next objective against this goal of um, transparent, 
transparency, accuracy, and improved understanding was to focus on education. Um, how can we build public understanding and trust in the results that we're delivering? It's really important that folks um, fully understand what we do, what we're accountable to do, um, and um, you know, can, can share and ask any questions that they want about our process, our approach, and our findings. So you might have seen some things this year. We've done a few different presentations on what, you know, who got what accountabilities for water across the city. Um, we did that in response to a very specific request that came in from a, from a member of our, our uh, city um, uh, who asked questions about different things that were going on and was unclear on which department had what accountability. So we, in working with those other departments, you know, created a, a presentation on that and shared that with the, with the constituent. Um, we also created a, a, you know, some presentations on how to interpret results, how to think about them, what does a geo mean, things like that. Um, so we're doing that with Board of Health presentations. We're testing, we're posting on social media around the same. We've improved our health department website so you can get to results right away um, and get to these kinds of explanatory um, documents that might be more helpful for you. Um, when individual residents call us with questions, oftentimes I'm fielding that inquiry or any of the team here does the same. Um, but we're really um, sure that we're answering the questions and being very explicit about what we're accountable for, what the results show, and what we're doing about it. Um, and when we're testing, people come up all the time and want to know what's happening and what we're doing. And so there's a, a you know, public-facing element to this job while we're in the testing environment. And I know that the whole department enjoys those conversations, particularly with those people at Plum Cove Beach. They're a very, very friendly group. Um, and then finally, the third objective against transparency, accuracy, um, and understanding of testing and results analysis was to be data driven. Um, I think it's really important to, uh, you know, create an environment where we are letting the data do the talking, the science do the talking, and there's not a lot of speculation. It's here's what we know, here's what we're exploring, and here's where we're going. And so on that note, um, to help us understand environmental causes for the enterococci that are in the creek and cause for closures or in any beach, really, um, we took that West, uh, that uh, Woodward and Curran study, and um, and acted on it. Um, we, you know, the mayor gave us some funding to provide DNA testing at our board of health recommendation. The board helped us um, source uh, a proper lab that um, Gabby will tell you more about. Some of the dynamics there, saving the city extreme uh, a great deal of money, but also ensuring accuracy and and um, uh, timeliness in, in posting results. We're testing monthly during the beach season for DNA to help us understand not just if it's avian, which is what the Woodward and Kern recommendation was, but also what are the levels of human and canine in there as well. So um, we'll be continuing that. We're gonna be doing it monthly to provide ongoing DNA testing. We wanna build a data set and really start to understand more about um, you know, the environmental drivers uh, for the numbers that we see in, in uh, reporting. So a little, um, I'm gonna spoil it for everybody else and tell you what we found out. Uh, the 2024 season did not see any large spikes in enterococci. We've had um, one of the best years le um, ever uh, with improved um, accuracy and quality in data collection as well as um, all the other things that I described for you that we took on. We found that the elevated levels were directly correlated to rain events or events of extreme turbidity, um, you know, wave action, high tides, the like, such as what we saw with Hurricane Ernesto, 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 I think. Um, and our bathing beach test results are really not remarkable, and I'll, we'll show you some data today when we compare them to other Massachusetts beaches, particularly in the Northeast Coast. Uh, so I think it's interesting to have some perspective, like not only what's happening in Gloucester, but how, does our, how do our results compare to other coastal communities nearby? Um, we see enterococci levels drop almost immediately after a tide cycle in and out. It's very rare that they persist, um, particularly in those big tidal areas. This year in the coves, you saw the numbers staying high for a little while, and um, we're going to help you understand more about that as we um, go into the results. Um, DNA testing drove home um, repeatedly every single test. That avian element is the highest level of bacteria that we're seeing. Um, and there were no reports, this is separate and distinct from um, DNA, but there have been no reports um, to the health department or um, through the Board of Health from lab results and people go, you know, if somebody gets sick and they go to the doctor and the doctor runs lab results, those lab results get reported to the state and the state through our MAVEN system instantly connects to us and our public health nurse does research to figure out where it came from. We've had zero um, reports of any test result um, for any, um, anybody being ill and we've had no complaints um, in our health department um, in any form um, either formal or otherwise, saying somebody got sick from the water. 
And the um, interesting thing to also understand from our research, and I'm not sure that this is widely known, but enterococci are living in the sand and they're living in the sediment. Um, and they, they can live there for a long time. Um, they can go dormant, they can get woken up. And so as soon as they get into the water column and they have those right conditions, they're gonna quickly populate. And so just a little bit more about that one. Um, you know, as you know, uh, as Joe said a little bit ago, enterococci are kind of bacteria that naturally are found in, um, in mammals, um, um, such as canine, avian, um, and human, and they play a role in digestion, and not just mammals, but also, also birds. Um, once in the environment, um, they can survive in various um, habitats, um, including soil, water, sediment, for extended periods of time. Um, NIH studies have shown that enterococci can live in a dormant state for up to two years. Um, it's a really important thing to, to pull in for a minute, and then when you see some results um, in a minute, I think it'll be um, helpful for you to recall that, especially in moist conditions like tides. Um, they, when they enter a, an a dormant state, they stay that way until conditions change. Um, if they're not favorable, they still are viable, so they can come back to life. And when they do, they quickly enter the water column and, um, uh, and they can produce very rapidly. Rainfall can do this, so water falling into the estuary um, and wetting sand that might typically not be wet or on the beach where it's typically staying dry because it's above a tide cycle. Um, if big tides come in or waves churning things up, it's pulling up. Um, this dormant bacteria, and it can very quickly reproduce. And I'm saying that because it's important for you to understand that there's history here. You know, when, when that happens, when those enterococci are being brought back to life, it's not because yesterday something hit the water that made that number go up. In the case of these events, when you have rain and turbidity um, and action, um, it is a natural thing for the bottom to get stirred up, the sand to get wet, the conditions to be favorable for these enterococci to, to reproduce very quickly. And the reason that's important is that there's a bit of history here. So enterococci that were created a while ago can hang out and then those critters can come back to life when the conditions warrant. And I don't know that that's been brought forward as a dynamic that we need to consider, but I think it's really important um, in the case of, of, our, of our beach testing. And so with that preamble, I'm gonna come back and talk with you in a little bit um, when we talk about next actions and some results. I'd like to hand it over to Bree Turco and she's going to help you understand sort of the process that we're following and the, what the results were this year. Bree? Thank you. All right. So Dominique's been touching on this a little bit already, um, but to minimize the risk of illness from contaminated water, um, beaches are required to be testicated for an indicator bacteria. For us um, in marine water, that is enterococci. Um, so let's dive right in here. Uh, there are two types of water quality standards. We have our single sample and our geometric mean or geomean. Um, so for us, the water quality standard for a single sample is 104 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. And the geomean standard is the 35 uh, colony forming units per 100 milliliters. So um, when we are sampling beaches during the bathing beach season, uh, our samples are generally taken from an area of greatest usage um, and we're taken from the same location each week. Um, there's usually two of us that go out. One is filling out a field data form um, that we're required to fill out. It includes all of the beaches, what time we're sampling, um, whether the water is clear or murky, uh, how calm or really bad is the water today, uh, how many birds do we see, how many people are in the water, um, is there rack, is there trash, um, is there animal or human waste that we're seeing. So we're recording all of this on a field data form uh, while a second person is actually sampling the water. So we use this little vial here to sample the water. Um, so we wade to a depth of three feet. Uh, we wait for debris to settle. And then we are removing that cap off of the sterile bottle, going down into a sweeping motion 12 inches under the water away from our body. Um, and then discarding a few millimeters to leave some air space. We're sealing that cap back on and putting it in a cooler. Uh, we do drop these off to a certified lab, uh, and which is currently Biomarine. Um, they then conduct our weekly analyses. They submit their results to the state and we get notified um, usually within 24 hours, the, the results are uploaded to a state portable and we are notified of those results. So um, weekly we are doing what we call a single sample. Um, 
So as you can kind of see in the diagram, uh, we have an image of three single samples, and then we have one that's then exceeding that 104 uh, water quality standard. Um, when that happens for most of our beaches, we are then taking a sample the following day. We're not required to post a closure um, for most of our beaches. So the state does, for beaches that have a history of, um, of a, you know, exceedances over multiple years, uh, they will require certain beaches to close after one exceedance. So the state has determined that for us, Good Harbor Creek and Pavilion Beach, because of their history, are required to close once we have just one single sample exceedance. For the majority of the rest of our beaches, if we have a single exceedance, we resample the next day, and then if that exceeds as well, then we are posting the beach closed. If it comes back normal, we're not closing at all. And so in following that up, if we do have a second exceedance, then we kind of get into the geo mean after that, which we can see from this other diagram. Um, and this is what happened with the storm with the storm churn that we saw at Plum Cove, Half Moon, Cressies, and Good Harbor Creek, um, is that we had multiple spikes and then we had normal water quality standards. However, since the geo mean is calculated on the most recent five test results, even though the single sample was below that 104 count, the geo mean was actually above 35. So the water, even though the waters were coming back below single sample standards, we still had to keep the beaches closed, which ended up for Plum Cove, kind of similar to this result was it being opened on that eighth day. Um, and like Dominique was saying, in 2024, we actually had a very good year. Um, in May, we did have Good Harbor Creek closed for a preemptive closure. Um, again, we had had a rainy uh, weekend, um, decided to hold off, close the beach, wait, and retest the following day after we had those tidal cycles. Um, in looking at some of the data I was going individually through some of the North Shore communities. There were quite a few instances of bacterial exceedances around May 28th. Um, so that just kind of showed for us how it was good that we preemptively closed in this case when other people had exceedances around the same time. Um, same thing in June, we had a two-day preemptive closure again for the creek. Um, in July, no closures, no exceedances. Uh, which was fantastic. And then um, in August, we did have um, a moment in August with a Good Harbor Creek closing for three days. Um, and then where we saw amongst, again, uh, a lot of the communities uh, up this way, we had our Ernesto stirred up a lot of things. Um, and we had a four-day closure for the creek, um, a two-day closure for Cressy's, a half, a half Moon had a six-day closure, and Plum Clove was closed for seven days. And I'll take it back to Dominique. I just uh, want to be sure that everybody understands this visual. Do you all follow that? Any Anybody want to know more about this? Are you? This is a really important part of our testing protocols, I want to be sure. And for members of the community that that you know are listening to this anytime you want to know and understand more about this we're happy to uh, happy to explain it to you it's a really important part of why beaches have to stay closed um, so i really like this slide because i think it provides context for what's happening across the rest of the community so beverly Danver, danvers essex gloucester's the fourth column there essex um essex is uh one beach that they test um ipswich marblehead nahant newberry Newburyport, Rockport, Salem, um, Salisbury, and Swampscott. So this is data from 2020 to 2023. It's pulled from annual reports that the state publishes. Um, and you can see that we are trending um, around um, you know, the norm. Some, some smaller communities have, have less, but um, we're not by any means remarkable in that we are you know, flagrantly higher in, in number um, of exceedances. Um, we will get um, in spring of 2025 the 2024 data, but I think, you know, as you just saw for the number of beaches that are closed this year, we only had really four events and one of them was Ernesto um, that got, got, you know, created all that turbidity and pulled up all that debris from the bottom and created a great environment for 
um, those enterococci uh, to, to be growing. Why can't I go forward? Okay, so um, I, so you know this helped us understand our results in, within context for others, and um, and so I'd like to hand it over now to to Gabby um, White, our assistant director, who was instrumental in um, working with the lab on the protocols and and um, did perform all of the DNA testing this year. Um, she's going to catch you up on what we did, what we found, and then I'll come back again. Gabby, thank you, Dominique. So I get to share a little bit of DNA testing with you. Um, as Dominique mentioned, the reason that we started DNA testing was in 2022. Um, the consultants recommended that we do so. And so here we are now doing it. Um, I wanted to thank the mayor for making the funding possible for us to do this extra testing and to the Board of Health for providing guidance on selecting laboratories that can do DNA testing. Um, the reason why we perform DNA testing is to give us a clearer picture of the bacterial sources, be they avian, human, canine, um, and really dial into the data so that we can um, make changes if needed. Um, we were able to save a considerable amount of money. The Woodard and Curran um, projection was $20,000 and we were able to do uh, testing for $500 a test, which was great. Um, thus far, we have done testing in June, July, and August of this year, um, and there is additional recommendations from Woodard and Curran um, to do an avian population assessment that we may look into in the future. Um, Um, so we've expanded, um, as I mentioned, the, the, sorry, we've expanded the DNA testing considerably to include not, just not avian, but also human and canine. Where are we testing? Um, as you can see, there's the creek and there's the bridge. On the left-hand side, as you're entering the beach, is the first sample taken in June in two inches of water. We selected that site because there was some dark sand in that area and it smelled. Uh, so we did a little investigation there. And then the next two areas that we tested were both in the blue dotted area, which is the primary beach site for the creek, which is where the guard chair is. Um, okay, next slide. So just like um, the enterococci testing for beach testing, we take a sample bottle. It's sealed when we receive it from the lab. Um, there is very strict chain of custody. The only difference with DNA testing is we don't have to be in three feet of water. We can take it in any depth of water. Okay. Um, similarly, we take that, um, those samples, we place them in coolers, we fill out extensive paperwork, we ship overnight to a lab in New Jersey, which is capable of doing DNA testing. The lab takes about a week to get the information back. It's on a portal that is reported on, um, and we start collecting the data. Okay, now here's the meat and potatoes. Um, the June sample. The June sample is the sample taken in the upper right-hand corner, which is um, on the left-hand side of the bridge as you enter, basically where the estuary empties out on an outgoing tide. You can see how it swirls in that area, and that's where the black sand was found. So in June, the, um, the lab indicated to us that because of amplification required to um, detect the source, they have to amplify the sample many, many times to get the DNA um, to be re detectable. Um, so they told us to read the samples as present or non-present. In the June sample, um, as you can see, human, avian, and canine were all present in the sample of the sand, as Dominique mentioned. That can be from sources from two years ago. It's living in the sand. Um, the July sample taken at the bathing beach, which is the lower right-hand photograph of me gathering data. Um, 
which is at the site that is considered the bathing beach of the creek where the guard chair is. Human was not detected, canine was not detected, but avian was present. Similarly, the August results are the same. Below LOQ just means that it was detected, but it was not. Um, LOQ is the, sorry, I'm sorry, the multiplier. Oh, the quantify, it's not quantifiable. It's a very, very, very low level. So what have we learned here is, as Dominique mentioned, that enterococci and bacteria can live in the sand and in the very low water. Um, let's just move on. So now we're moving on to recommendations. Back to Dominique. Okay, so um, these are actually not just from the Gloucester Health Department. These are um, what the state rights for people to be aware across all the coastal beaches in Massachusetts. Um, avoid swimming after heavy rain events. Bacterial levels tend to rise due to runoff after heavy rains. And as um, we've seen in our ecosystem, and particularly in the area of Good Harbor Creek, estuary is leading directly into those areas, both before the swimming beach on one side of the bridge and then at the swimming beach on the other side of the bridge. Um, watch for signs of water pollution, such as discolored or fast flowing water. Um, after Ernesto, um, I'm sure you all have walked over the bridge at Good Harbor Creek. It's normally, you can see the fish, it's very clean and clear, you can see a lot, but on the days after Ernesto, um, you, Gabby couldn't see you know, from the water level down. It was just completely um, brown water. Um, so if it's discolored, if it's fast flowing, strong smelling, um, you know, when in doubt, stay out. Um, avoid swimming next to drain pipes, um, outlets, or other obvious sources um, that could be carrying um, bacteria into the water. Um, this one doesn't really apply to us too often, thankfully. Don't swim near trash or street litter <laughs> floating in the water. I think we, we're pretty good on that one. Um, avoid swallowing water. Most swimmers are exposed when they swallow water. And swim only in areas designated as swim beaches. Don't swim in rivers or streams unless they're designated as swim beaches. And I think that's a really important takeaway here. One side of Good Harbor Creek Bridge is a beach. The other side of Good Harbor Creek is part of the estuary leading to the beach. And so um, I think it's important that people think about that um, before they go in those small, um, shallow, eddying waters that are um, seemingly warm and lovely, but um, we've learned carry a lot of bacteria. So what can you do as a citizen of Gloucester? Um, this is an important message for all of us to give to our residents. We sh certainly share this. Um, clean up after your pets, not just on the beach, but on the streets. Um, anything that your pets make on the street are going to get washed into the storm pipes and can make their way into the water. Um, don't feed birds. Don't feed seagulls. It helps them populate. They make, they stay here. Um, they go to the bathroom. Um, that creates enterococci and um, can um, increase those numbers. Uh, use public restrooms. Don't, you know, um, use the ocean. Um, even um, changing diapers, you know, use wipes and keep them with you and take them back home with you. Don't uh, use the ocean as a, um, a way to clean the baby's bottom, which we've seen happen a few times at the creek. Um, do not enter the water if you're feeling ill. Um, you know, here's my comment on diapers. Put plastic rubber pants and make sure your kids are not contributing there. Um, boat sewage offshore, um, five miles, uh, or, or, you know, obviously the Harbor Master's offering services there as well. Do not dump anything down storm drains. Um, water moving through storm drains does not get treated necessarily at a wastewater facility and can flow into our, our lakes and streams, our oceans. Um, avoid fertilizers, pesticides, and, um, and use walkways. Don't walk on the dunes. When you walk in the dunes, it helps to create erosion um, at vegetation that might um, filter out pollutants um, and other well, can get harmed and uh, can stop doing the excellent job that it does. So from a next action standpoint, what does all that mean? This is uh, the, the last slide, I believe. And so thank you for being so patient through this. We just wanted to be sure you had a really good understanding. Um, we know we want to continue to build public understanding of bathing beach ecosystem. Um, we want um, nature happening happens. You know, you're swimming where other animals live and eat. Um, and we want to continue to help people understand that. Um, we're, we'd like to propose that we develop some educational signage. Um, here's a picture on the right there of um, signage that was at um, a national seashore where people are helping the public understand the dynamics of what's going on in their community and understand that you know you are swimming in other animals' homes um, and it's not a chlorinated pool, um, it's other animals' homes. So just you know, kind of 
helping to make clear the ecosystem, the birds that are coming and going, um, what happens you know, in the cycle of life um, in our estuaries, into the creek and uh, other beaches. Um, we really wanna start citizen testing trips and, and welcome those interested to let us know. You can come join the health department when we go out testing, you can see how we do it. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. And so very interested in hearing from any citizens that wanna uh, come and uh, hang out at the health department and learn more about that and um, help us be more effective in how we communicate around this. Um, to improve public safety, big part of our job here, um, we really recognize that while we were faster in getting signage up this year, we didn't do a very good job of the signage. Um, it's, it's more difficult than we thought to get those fixed signs in place. And so um, we are really committed to making sure that we can put beach signage up that is clear at every entrance that cannot be mistaken. At Plum Cove Beach, I think we had four or five signs up um, and folks were just walking by and not even realizing that they were there. So they have to be more obvious, they have to be present, and we have to be sure that we're really clear um, because you know you should not swim. When we post a beach, you should not swim. Um, we want the beaches to be open as much as you do, um, but when we're posting it, it's because there's a level of bacteria in the water that can make you sick, and you can get really sick. You know, people that are immunocompromised can get very sick. Babies can get very sick. So it's really important that you heed that message. It's very important that we can make sure that that message is seen. Um, and so we talked to you a little about when you see weather events, astronomical tides, those eddying waters that seem so warm and wonderful um, are actually a breeding ground for bacteria. So do not recommend that um, you know, small children are swimming in those eddies on the other side of the bridge. We don't think that's very wise. Um, and we think it's important that, um, that we continue to measure and learn. We're going to continue our DNA testing. Um, if, we, if you see something, please contact us. If you see something that doesn't look right, um, something that um, is particularly smelly on one day, you know, let us know about that. We're happy to come out, take a look, um, do some water samples. Um, and uh, we want to be sure that we're um, creating messaging and taking action where warranted. Um, and continuing that DNA testing. So thanks very much for your time. I know parts of this were a little slow, but again, we wanted to be sure that we spent some time in making sure everybody ever understood everything. So we're happy to take any questions that you might have. First of all, I just wanna, if I may, uh, thanks to Dominique, Gabby, Bree, uh, Joe, and the whole volunteer Board of Health for all the work they did. Um, the DPW did quite a bit of work over the last couple of years doing uh, some testing way up beyond the beach to where the water sources begin. And uh, there was a lot of talk mentioned about the funding that I provided, but there's also funding thanks to uh, Senator Tarr and Rep Ferrante through earmarks to the city. So I just wanna you know, give the credit where the credit is due. And with that, uh, the team is here to answer any questions you may have. Excellent, thank you, Mayor Verga. So I'm gonna open this up for questions from the council. I just wanna remind you that we were notified yesterday that we had any questions to put them um, ahead of time. Um, we were privy to the same slideshow we saw tonight. I'm not expecting a lot of questions, but by all means, if someone does have a question they didn't want to submit or didn't submit but would like to ask right now, uh, now is your time. Uh, Councilor Grace. Hi, thank you. Um, great presentation. Just curious, um, the bacteria can live in a dormant state in the sand. Is it possible for any of this bacteria to lie dormant in a human? Uh, She's asking if bacteria can live in a human and be dormant in a human. I think if it's in you, it's alive, um, doing its job, and then it leaves you. <laughs> and that's when it gets to join the sand at the beach. Is that helpful? Excellent. Uh, Council Worthley? Yes, thank you. Um, firstly, as Mayor mentioned, uh, Joe Rosa, the Board of Health, is a volunteer board, and you have such great responsibility, and you take it seriously, and you make a difference. So thank you. And Dominique and Bree, and Gabby, thank you for your presentation. Appreciate the mayor making this available to us. Um, so I appreciate also us having the pre-slide and the opportunity to ask questions in advance. There were some things that were presented tonight that was in addition to that slide. So those have prompted a few questions. If I could go through just a couple, uh, if you don't mind. We can do one at a time and then move on. Okay. Um, so firstly, I want to say great job on the protocol and the transparency and the communication. I think there's been an incredible improvement and I know it hasn't always been easy. Um, the first question would be, is there something that the council or the public can do to make that easier for you and more effective? Just wanna throw that out there for discussion. 
you know, I think what's really important is that the public recognizes that we're following state guidelines and we're doing what the state tells us to do and we take our jobs very seriously. And so anything we can do to, um, you know, ask questions, help, you know, if you have a question, if you don't believe a number, if you're not, if you're seeing something that you just don't get or it can't be right, um, please come to us and ask us and we're happy to explain it. Um, you know, sometimes when you go on social media and you, you, you have an opinion, um, it can be tough to stop that swirl. And so we're really focused on facts in the health department and really welcome anybody asking us any question. We're happy to answer it for you. So really focusing on the facts is the guidance that we would give in addition to the points we made on um, the things that people can do to keep the bacteria that we all make out of the water. <laughs> Five or six I'll wait till Just a, a quick, a quick question. Um, two, well, it's two part. But does the estuary system itself, just by its nature, because it has standing water in it for a long period of time during the day, it doesn't flush in and out completely. Does that does that uh, lend itself to to increased um, contamination or the better breeding ground for endor endorcocci? And then the second part of that question is. Can we, given the DNA results and the fact that the, we've had such low exposures this summer, are we feeling more comfortable about ruling out issues that have been rumored before about septic intrusions and, and sewer intrusion, things like that, that along the uh, Thatcher Road area? You can answer I can that. Speak to that. Um, yeah, so, so what we're trying to be sure of is that we're showing actual correlation that we can prove. And so as it relates to, um, the, to Thatcher Road, um, really focusing on, as we do for, you know, across the city, by the way, not just on our, on our um, properties of budding water, is really looking carefully at what we can do to improve compliance and, and take care of the systems that are in failure. Um, this year, we were quite successful in working with three homes that were very near the water, and the homeowners um, took it very seriously, took our guidance very seriously, and got it taken care of. And so all of those systems are completely compliant right now. And that was um, pretty close to the water, so we're really happy about that one. Um, but what's important to know also is that even though those systems were sitting there and they may not have been in compliance, our, our results still weren't showing anything. You know, the estuaries do a terrific job of cleansing. That's part of their job, and um, they're doing their jobs. But it is sitting in there, and it is reproducing when the conditions are right. So um, if you have tide cycles coming in and out, they like that edge of water, and they'll keep producing. So there's a lot of muck in the estuaries, right? It's naturally occurring, and it's going to be there. And when it gets pulled out, that means it's right there with us. So I think that's, like, one of the key messages I wanted to be sure we all knew about. Um, but the health department is very focused on um, um, helping people understand how to be compliant um, with their on-water, on-site wastewater systems. And uh, we're happy to come back and tell you all all about that <laughs> if you're so interested, because it's an exciting topic for us. And Joe, I don't know if you want to speak to the first half of that question. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the whole question, Jason. But let me, let me just say a couple words about um, clarifying enterococci are the uh, organisms that the state mandates that we test all over the state. They, in and of themselves, are not dangerous, but they are an indicator of the presence of fecal matter, because the only place they come from is the digestive system of warm-blooded animals. However, th that also highlights the second fact, and that is the test that's done does not distinguish between human, avian, coyotes, whatever it is. So that's, so we've done this DNA testing using a different microorganism, bacterioides, um, that has been genetically sequenced for a whole variety of organisms, including people, birds, canines, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we can distinguish the presence of that indicator species in canines, humans, and, and uh, avian. So I've, I've forgotten what your question specifically was. Did I touch on it at least? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think there was a lot of concern. I think we already talked about it, the, the fact the health department's been so, uh, you know, good about getting uh, failed systems back into compliance yeah, yeah. is that that, that, was, that was often thought of as the source of the problem. And yet it sounds like it, sounds like it might be the plovers. It, we don't know. Is there any other questions before we circle back? Uh, Councillor Val Gilman. So I'm going to keep this as a question, but thank you all for this presentation. Fascinating, very detailed oriented. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess my, my question is, uh, knowing all the spots in the community where 
folks like to feed the gulls and you witness it. Um, <clears throat> you, for example, the corner near the tavern where mm -hmm. people are using that beach, the folks that, that congregate there are always feeding the gulls. And even being at Yellers recently, there were gulls trying to come down on us as we were eating and, and they had to push them away. So the gulls are so comfortable in that section. And I guess my, my question is, can we get adequate signage at that part about the ordinance basically says you can get fined up to three hundred dollars? And I'm just wondering if kind of doing a sign campaign for some of those areas where it, it makes it a lot easier. Like I do the mutnit containers in the whole boulevard, so I'm down there a lot and I see this. And I'm not that comfortable walking up to people and saying, hey, do you know that that um, there's a 300, you know, up to a $300 fine if you get caught feeding the gulls. But if there were signs there, it would be really easy to go over and just not even say I'm a city councilor because I'm not the enforcement agent, but to just kind of point and say, just FYI, you know, you, you know, it's really not a good thing. So I'm just wondering if we could target some of those areas and, and make sure that they're well signed. And then I don't know if Bree as the senior health inspector has the authority to enforce, and I'm not sure if- Something else for you to do, Bree. <laughs> to do that. But, um, but I'm, just, I'm just thinking that sometimes, you know, more eyes can help. And- um, Well, certainly you know, discouraging people there. from feeding gulls is, would help, whether or not it would solve the problem, I doubt. Yeah. But nonetheless, it would certainly help. Um, uh, putting up signs is pretty easy. It's easy to take down as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. Uh, uh, certainly, I mean, well, as the, the presentation said, education is going to be a big part of it. Uh, but we can look at targeted areas where signage goes. I mean, signs, we have signs all over town that are ignored anyway, so why not add a couple more? But I wouldn't advise against anybody trying to... Uh, you know, even be per perceived as law enforcement because we live in a very crazy world and you never know how people are going to snap back. But uh, point taken. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other council like to? Uh, <laughs> Councillor, we'll, we'll go with Council Nemard. Again, thank you. Excellent presentation. And I think we all got seriously the message about um, helping to educate the public and how important that is. You've given us some tools and some very sound material to work with. Um, as the Ward 1 City Councilor, I'm active with the Friends of Good Harbor Beach, and as the Mayor knows, there are constituents that are eager to work more closely with uh, the Department of Public Works to upgrade and improve the educational signage in the three, four, five kiosks that are already there or in the process of being rehabilitated to be updated. Uh, and w w just reiterating our, their interest and our interest in working with you to utilize those signage platforms, there's not too much sign pollution, it's contained in a professional national parks kind of standard, but to make sure that that, in, that environmental and ecological information is there to help people understand why we don't want to feed the gulls and why they have to be careful in the creek at after storm events, that sort of thing. And uh, we'd be happy to come talk to the Friends of Good Harbor Creek, um, invite them into our offices or come, you know, if you all have meetings or anything, we'd, you know, welcome that opportunity to educate and and listen um, to the public and, and what their concerns are to be sure we're answering um, our questions well. Thank you. You know, sometimes there's not a lot to see. There's not a lot to tell you beyond what we've told you today. Um, but, you know, again, uh, perception's reality. So I want to be sure that we're really focused on communicating well. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor. Memhard, Councillor Benson. Thank you. And thank you um, all for coming here and presenting well, a very detailed mm -hmm. presentation, and it's important that we follow the science. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just stress that. Um, you spoke about, I had a couple questions, but you spoke about um, smell. If, could you like just elaborate <laughs> on that? Is that, was that a, is that a sign of contamination? Odor is not a sign of contamination. It's just um, an indicator to, make you more aware, and in that situation, sometimes the odor is low tide, right? 
Um, but in that particular instance, there was odor and black sand, which just uh, required more inquiry, and that's what we did. Okay. That whole section of the beach, by the way, has completely, that whole section of the beach on the other side of the bridge has completely reshaped, and it's often reshaped, you know, so as big storms come in and churn it up, um, it's going to keep moving around, so anything else, Councilor Benson? I had a few more questions, but I think we're going for an, uh, uh, We're going to circle back to Council Worsley, please. Thank you. Just one more question, and then I have four or five questions. So you tell me when. I'll just do one now, right? Okay. Is there still a task force? Uh, I think it was a memo from the mayor from, or Jill Cahill that said there's a task force of, I think it was health department, DPW, some volunteers that were meeting. Is that task force still working? Do we have minutes of those meetings, potentially, not necessarily minutes, but just reports from that committee? Or has it been sort of dormant, like interim? Uh, well, obviously, um, the city meets across departments to help be sure that we're, you know, um, all working um, towards the common goal. Um, I know DPW is um, very focused on constantly looking for any source of um, breach or break that could be creating any, um, any water issues and constantly finds them and constantly fixes them. We have old infrastructure here. Um, and um, so we meet about that. Um, where what, what we haven't done and what we talked about um, recently when I was sharing this uh, content was, um, you know, I would love to bring the people into our office and, and, you know, have folks that are really interested in this. That's why we'd love to talk to the friends of Good Harbor Creek um, and, you know, start that, um, you know, that dialogue. From a task force standpoint, that implies that there's a problem that we need to solve. And I think what's really important to know is that we are in a wild environment. There are animals, um, the city, um, certainly the health department and its focus on compliance to um, on-site wastewater treatment. And DPW, of course, and its management of the infrastructure, we're constantly working to make sure that these, you know, the causes of um, pollutants into our water are mitigated as soon as possible. So, so I think we started out by saying there's no smoking gun here. And there really isn't. We have looked really hard to try and figure out if there's a source. There isn't one source. It's, you know, we believe that a lot of what we're experiencing is past. Um, we're certainly seeing ter terrific results right now. Um, focus on, again, reminder of that consistency. We're not, um, we're, you know, testing at the same time every single time. And so, uh, you know, I'm confident that our beaches are clean. Um, I think they're probably cleaner than they've ever been. And they'll get cleaner as, you know, the work that we do, the work that DPW do continues and, uh, and will always be going on, right? It's not, people's systems will fail. They'll have to fix them. Um, pipes will break. They'll have to be fixed. Uh, but really, there's not, you know, in our opinion, anything that's causing this, you know, enter, enter a cockeye to grow at an alarming rate. We see cause and effect only in when there is weather, then we have, then we have numbers. Councillor. Well, two, th two quick things. I, first, I, I don't want to get any angry emails. I was kidding about the plovers. There's only <laughs> six of them. Um, they've gone. They, and they've gone. So it's not their fault. Um, there was a story in the Boston Globe a few weeks ago, I want to say, that had a, a roundup of the, na of the states, the whole Commonwealth's um, bathing and swimming areas. And I just, um, I don't have a question. I just would encourage people to check that out because it, it also pointed to the fact that Gloucester is relatively low in its incidence of, of closures and contaminations compared to a lot of the rest of the Commonwealth, both freshwater and, and saltwater areas. So I think, you know, whatever we're doing, we're doing the right thing. And it's, it's great to see. So thank, thank you. you. Excellent. Some beaches in Boston have to be tested every day because of the number of exceedances that they've had. So, you know, if you look at that state data, it's quite telling about the challenges of, you know, that many other communities face. Uh, we're going to go back to Councilor Benson. Thank you. Um, and you, so you spoke, um, Director, about people getting sick because there is an urge, like the signs are up and someone may want to go, well, I'm just going to jump in. Could you speak of like to like the effects of someone becoming very ill from, from the bacteria that is in the water? Yeah, um, from a tummy ache to urinary tract infections um, to sepsis, right? Sepsis is when your body is basically shutting down. So um, bad things can happen. Um, so that's why when we have those signs posted, you need to keep, stay out and keep your children out. Um, and, um, and certainly, you know, pay attention to not swallowing water. I think that's the guidance that I would offer. And, and to just elaborate on that, if the water, but if say 
some folks may say, well, the water's closed. Is it safe to be on the actual beach? Like, yes, it is safe to be on the actual beach. Um, enjoy the beautiful views that we have here in Gloucester. Um, they're, they're just to die for. Um, oh, bad word choice. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, the beach views are gorgeous. And so um, reminder that the endorcaci in dry conditions are dormant, right? They can't really be reproducing in dry sand. Um, they like it wet. And so when they, in the water, on the edge of the water, on the edge of the water, I can't say that enough, on the edge of the water, um, in that creek, you really should um, not be swimming when the beach is closed. Yes. Sure. If you can okay. speak. Chairman Rosa just said, I'm sorry, what chairman? No. If Joe wants to speak, make sure he speaks in the mic, but not, not because we're complaining, but people at home can't hear him. Sorry, I was just, I was just saying that the one thing you don't want to do is, is get an open wound exposed to bacteria, either be in the sand or water. That's the best way to get a good infection. Excellent. Thank you, Not a good infection, but <laughs> no, no, I know what you say. Um, All right. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to ask a question before we go back to Council Worthley? Uh, Council Worthley. Thank you. Um, when you do dry weather testing, it would eliminate the avian option, right? Um, well, in dry weather, birds aren't using toilets to, right? So that would be exfiltration and infiltration as identified in the 2021 report from Woodward and Curran. Are we doing dry weather testing? Explain. So dry weather means it's not raining. Wet weather means it's raining. Um, and birds always go to the bathroom anyways, like they don't really care. No, so it's not- But the rain would, would flush up. Oh yeah, so certainly water. wet, exactly. Wet it's conditions solution. would be higher. Right. So wouldn't, maybe it doesn't eliminate it, but it would focus it more on human, as, as the report says, human oriented or originated bacteria. Yeah, we um, didn't, we, all of our samples to date have been in dry weather. We haven't taken any wet weather samples of DNA. Okay. Um, let's see. There were a number of projects identified or, or questions at least raised in the report, one of which was um, it's called fog, fats, oils, and grease that was clogging the pipe, I think, on Neptune Place. And they couldn't get the camera to see what needed to be seen with the clogging. The recommendation was that we would grout and clear that pipe out. Have we done that, to your knowledge? The DPW does that work all the time. Um, when, when systems fail, um, you know, that stuff is created from restaurants, and, and you know, it can fail inside the restaurant, it can fail outside the restaurant. There's often systems that are collecting that grease outside of a restaurant, um, and, you know, those systems fail if people don't, um, uh, you know, take care of them well and, and are compliantly. It's a big part of our inspection process is helping restaurants who are a big creator of this um, to understand the importance of cleaning out, um, you know, fats, oils, and grease um, filters, both inside um, and outside. So that to your knowledge, if I may, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but do you know if that work's been done? On I don't. I don't, Counselor. It's not a question for my department. Fair enough. I don't know specifically because there were a lot of photos. You refer to the report from a couple of years ago. What? You're referring to the the report from a couple of years ago. Years yeah, ago. the um, there were photos of specific areas. I don't know. I know that DPW has replaced a lot of pipes, sections of pipes and things like that. Um, I could ask Mike, um, he's on vacation this week when he returns, if he could sort of pinpoint the ones in the report, the status. Okay, are you asking me to pinpoint the questions that were in the report? No, no, I, I, we can do that. Okay, um, so I'll ask a couple others that you might know the answers to, and sure. if you don't, we'll just continue with asking Mike. Oh, hold um, on one second. Sorry. Does any other council have any yeah. questions? Question. Councilor uh, Benson. All right, thank you. Um, Acting president. Um, my question for is, so we looked at, so years we're talking about rain too. Like if we have a very wet summer, we're gonna see an increase. Would that be correct? It's kind of a rhetor, I, I kind of knew, but I just wanted confirmation and apologize for the dumb question earlier regarding odor. I was wanting clarification, but yeah. So if we see a more um, wet summer, we're gonna see a higher rate. Okay. All right, well, thank you. And thank you very much for all of your work, and I appreciate it. Excellent. We'll circle back to Council Worthley for question five of the five he said he had. This is my third question. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, um, thank you. So um, there was a the Hart Street pump station was also raised as a, a question. Um, again, is that just we'll ask Mike when he gets back. Yeah, I know there was work done there. I, they, they did, I believe in a rain event, we had sent over a pumper truck to 
to handle the flow because it's not just the sewer flowing through it's the other stuff coming in from out yes it's ongoing it will be because as you know it's uh 50 years ago it wasn't quite as close to sea level as it is now there was a so. broken pipe apparently on heart street i think that was actually repaired um, yeah if, if there was a, a identified broken pipe i i would say with 100 percent assurance those would have been tackled if we've identified the area uh, the, the question is on those other photos in the report, if they got to those. But the ones that were known problems, we it's it's nonstop for DPW. They're always tackling those. There was a um, recommendation in there that said that there were illicit, illicit discharges of chlorine and ammonia, which they suspected were coming from poorly or, or wrongly attached um, washers, washer and dryer, not dryers, and washing machines. Do we do anything with that? That, that's a good question. I think a lot of people have uh, what they call them, uh, dry wells. You know, they would have their septic system going this way, and then they'd have their washing machine just going to a hole in the ground. Um, but that's another one. I, I wouldn't even want to guess. If, that was a suggestion from the report, a, a probable cause. And I don't know the answer to if that was an actual cause. Excellent. Uh, Council Worth, we're going to take a break for one second. And that sure. was question four, not five. Sorry, I stand corrected. Uh, our CAO, Jill Cahill, has her hand raised and would like to say something. Thank you, Sean. I was just going to let Councilor Worthley know that um, we specifically focused today on the public, the health department. And um, if he wants to send me directly his follow-up questions related to DPW, um, Mike and I will respond to him and more than happy, if it warrants it, come back with a separate presentation on um the DPW work. Today's focus was obviously on the work of the health department. So, Councilor Worthley, please email me directly. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Jill. One more question that is health department related, if I could okay. ask it. Let me just ask, does anybody else Sorry. have any other questions before we circle back to Council Worthley? Council Worthley, the floor Thank you. is yours. This is specifically to your uh, presentation today. Um, you indicated that you haven't heard any reports from doctors or people being sick. Um, and I have two, two parts to this question. Do we have a mechanism? Do they automatically report to the health department if that's the case? Or is it, you know, if someone gets sick in three days, if someone goes to the beach, and if they get sick three days later, that the doctors and a good doctor might not know that it came from the creek, so yeah. there might not be a quick indicator. And then do we have a way of capturing the visitors who come here, go to their doctor's or maybe get sick, go to doctors out of town, would they know to contact your office? I, I don't yeah. think that's the case, but could you help thank me? You. Yeah, thank you for that question. So, um, you know, your question is a really important one because, you know, people go to the beach and, and you know, let's say they get sick, they need to let us know, right? So um, y what I'm telling you is the data we have, and we're trying to be very data-driven, as I said. And uh, so, so, you know, if you're sick, go to the doctor. The doctor's going to run tests. Those tests are 100% automatically sent to the state and 100% automatically sent back to us to be alerted. So if you have a foodborne illness, you eat in a restaurant, you get sick, you go to the dock, we know about it. Um, if you're swimming at the beach and you go to the dock and you know, we'll know about it. And so I think it's important to know that the facts are what I re reported to you. What you just speculated on is like somebody from another town comes. No, I, I may not know about that, but if they um, reference um, elements of Gloucester, um, the health department from that city would likely give us a ring because everybody cares deeply about health. So um, this is not a necessarily process, but it is like- So you're saying the doctor's offices locally communicate? No, they, commu they, they um, would send lab results to a lab um, the lab executes those results, and then the results are automatically, in the case of communicable disease or something like this, cause and effect would be um, reported to the state, and then we would be alerted to that. I didn't know that. Thank you yeah. for sharing that with me. Always privacy preserving, by the way. Like, you know, only our public health nurse might know who you are to follow up on a case, but not, the people in the health department themselves do not know. It's been very enlightening. Thank you. You're Excellent. welcome. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Mayor. I don't have a question. I, I do want to say that. Um, almost nine years as a city councilor, we've had a lot of questions about more, more especially the creek. Um, this is by far the best presentation with the most information. The administration and the, the Board of Health has really stepped it up. And I, I think the public has a lot of their answers that they are looking for. And um, I think you did an excellent job tonight mm -hmm. and uh, you all deserve a round of applause.
he says. The, to the team, they did most of the work as usual. With that being said, I'd like to take a five minute recess and I think we have to do a vote on that, Grace. Okay, so uh, moved. all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna convene for a picture for the open door. Um, all city staff um, and volunteers um, are invited to be with the picture. And if we do all city staff and volunteers, I'd like to ask if Ethan could take the picture for us and uh, help us out with that. Excellent. Okay, either way. Where do you want us, Councillor, President? Where would you like us? I see you're in front, but I'm gonna go a little break first. And then okay. Get together. Hey, um, yeah, like in front of that. Sean has to go to the bathroom. Board of Health want to come in? Come on, Board of Health. Our Health Department. Ah, stand right in front. 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 Right Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> oh, don't go away. Oh, Jordan, get in here. Don't get in there. Tom, do you want to put one with us? We good? <laughs> okay. All right. I said three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a certain time you want out of the top set or you don't care? Oh, any time after Because I said, I'm going to say short eight. three when we wanted to go last week because I said, no one will show up. No, and so I said, all right, I said, so I said, today, I'm going to see her, and then I said, I'm going to ask him, if he's not too busy, I'm going to ask him, hi, I'm going to ask him. No, he'll enjoy it. But don't just stay there.
efforts aren't very flattering. I was looking at myself and like, <laughs> Dude, these shirts are so comfortable. I have a Oh, that's a nice one. X degree. Not because of one. Move to adjourn. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. All right, let's rock and roll. <clears throat> That's all right. Your, I mean, I'll it, 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 it was sort of health related, I'll not su not out. sewer, but it, it, these things I'm are going to actually be a little expensive. Or All righty. Madam Clerk, what's next on the agenda? The consent agenda. Is there any councilors that wish to pull any matters off the consent agenda? Councilor Grow. I'd like to pull off uh, City Council Order 2024-021 and City Council Order 2024-022. I move to accept the consent agenda as amended. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I need a second. Second. Well, it's not as amended. It's with, it's without the, with the two off of it. Yes, you're going to vote on the consent agenda as amended, right. and then the okay. items that were removed. Yep. Got we'll it. get Sorry. discussed. We'll get. You're right. I I'll second you. But you, Dan, you want to vote on this? Second. Do we vote already? Ben moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. You. Good. So on mine, uh, these are two uh, uh, zoning uh, uh, amendments that um, are uh, citywide in scope. So I'm going to make a motion that we waive notice to abutters in accordance with GZO section 1.11.4B and set the public hearing date to Tuesday, November 12th, 2024, and further that we vote to refer to P&D and the planning board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's Jason. Super duper. And we motion. We don't. We don't. We're done. We're done with that. We're done with that. Um, next up, Madam Clerk. September fifth, Budget and Finance Standing Committee report. Councilor Memhart. Welcome back, Vice Chair Nolan. <laughs> Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, for your consideration tonight, we really only had one voting matter, although there is another I'll highlight, just information only. But uh, last Thursday, Budget and Finance voted on a memorandum from the city clerk, uh, 2024 <clears throat> Special Budgetary Transfer Number 1, re re requesting the transfer of funds to staff the early voting period uh, in the amount of $1,460, and I so move. Second. And the motion was made by myself, seconded by Councillor Gross. Budget and Finance voted two in favor, zero opposed. Councillor Worthley was not quite yet present to recommend that the City Council approve special budgetary transfer 2025 SBT 1 in the amount of $1,460 from the City Clerk, wages, hourly, permanent, account number as noted, to registration, purchase of services, account number as noted. And this is for the purpose of funding early voting staff during the early voting period of August 25th, 2024 through August 30th, 2024. And I so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the, the two other items that I would just uh, highlight for you. Uh, the, fir <clears throat> the first relates to uh, Kenny Costa's presentation um, regarding the city's fiscal year 2023 annual comprehensive financial report or ACFR. I would urge you to review the documents summarizing that as well as the report itself. It's a really excellent um, uh, self-promotion of the city of Gloucester, our financial health and the diversity of our economic uh, community. 
Um, Kenny answered a lot of questions. He put a lot of time and effort into that presentation and making us aware of the recognition and the awards that the city has received because of its financial uh, good, good housekeeping and management. And that's very, very important. And uh, the second item was a regard, regard of um, our discussion and review of preliminary fiscal year 2024 beach revenue, which was a question that Councillor Worthley had made sure we, we followed up on. And uh, uh, Connor McCorkle, our, our CFO, and Kenny uh, did their best to give us an up-to-date, year-to-date uh, uh, update on that, which was quite interesting and, and enlightening. It's still, of course, not complete for the summer season as such, given it ends in June. Uh, Council Worthy, I don't know if you want to comment on the information that you felt that garnered us. If you Council mind. Worthy. Yeah, thank you. So firstly, um, I want to thank Connor and Kenny for providing information to us. And um, when we were going through the budget last year uh, in May and June, there was a, uh, not a shortfall, but it hadn't reached the, you know, the beach season because it's July, August, and then June of the fiscal year. We didn't have the June numbers and everyone knows the weather was fantastic. We were looking at a million dollar shortfall potentially and we caught up and actually exceeded that by about three hundred thousand dollars that doesn't mean great let's go spend that money it just means that the potential for that deficit in that line item um isn't there and so that really um it tells us that the i think that what it tells us is that the numbers that we're looking at are reliable and um and so that gives us good information to help us as we're planning next year's budget where we have we don't have it yet, but July, August, and next June's, we won't know that till the end of June, but that gives us some good, um, good uh, confidence in that. So I was really impressed with the results, and I appreciate Connor and Kenny providing that information. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Budget and Finance. Madam Clerk, next on the agenda. There was no ordinances and administration meeting on September 2nd because it was a holiday. So the next item is the September 4th Planning and Development Standing Committee report. Councillor Grell. Thanks, sir. Uh, we, we don't have anything to vote on tonight, but uh, just a word on tomorrow, which is going to be the um, Joint Planning Board and City Council meeting September 11th at 6.30 here in Kairos Auditorium. Um, both bodies will open their public hearings for discussion on the 3A zoning proposal that was discussed at the P&D meeting and um, is being brought forward for a uh, final vote. Um, tomorrow night, the, my understanding of the plan is, is that the City Council will open uh, the public hearing. We will hear people for as long as they are here to be heard, uh, and that we will continue our public hearing uh, until September 26th, because we made announcements during the process that that would be an additional day for public hearing. Um, the planning board, on the other hand, uh, may choose at the end of the public hearing, at the end of the evening, to close their public hearing if they so choose, and take a vote on the proposal as a recommendation to the city council. That's a necessary step for us to take our vote. So um, it's kind of in their hands. That's their their meeting and their public hearing. Um, but my, my expectation is, is that that, uh, that will probably be what happens. Um, City Council, on the other hand, will continue on until the 26th. I'm not guaranteeing that the planning board will close. I just My assumption is that they will take a vote tomorrow night. So thank you, Councillor Gross, and that is correct. The City Council will not close our public hearing tomorrow night. So there is another time frame for people to come and speak if they wish. Um, next up, Madam Clerk. Public hearing 2024 number 24 to amend the Gloucester Code of Ordinances Chapter 22 Traffic and Motor Vehicles Section 22-270 Parking Prohibited at All Times and Section 22-291 Towaway Zones by adding Washington Street in a southerly direction 39 feet from its intersection with Grove Street. Excellent. I'll open the public hearing and I'll ask for um, Councillor Worthley or Grace to be the speaker on this, as they are the foundings of the ordinance change. Yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> Basically, what we're doing here is just um, extending a little bit past the crosswalk to have no parking. Um, currently, the parking is allowed right up to the crosswalk. People are parking in the crosswalk. Um, you know, when large vehicles are parked there and pedestrians um, cannot see what's coming down um, Washington Street. 
um, around these large vehicles without actually going out into the street. So um, it's bringing it into compliance with state law as well as just making it safer for people in that area. It's a busy intersection. It's a wonky intersection with the way that Grove Street, you know, connects with Centennial Ave kind of in a diagonal way. There was another accident there the other day. Um, so I think that in the interest of safety of our pedestrians and making our city a walkable city, I think it's a good idea. Excellent. Thank you, Councilor Grace. Councilor Worthley, we'd like to add to that. Yes, thank you. Um, I've enjoyed partnering with Councilor Grace on these. Um, she's been a value asset and really helpful, especially where we both kind of live in the area and see this firsthand regularly. Um, so this is a continuation of small improvements that we've been seeing over the course of the last year. Um, and uh, it's we're looking at 39 feet from the intersection of Grove Street back towards Washington, which covers the distance of the crosswalk, and then the 20 feet um, beyond the crosswalk, which follows state law. This will help when you're turning out of Grove Street, so you can see better. It'll help people who are crossing the street not have to walk into the street so far because there's a cart right there. It'll help the people coming down Washington Street towards the rotary to see people. And also, that left-hand turn out of Centennial, you end up right close to that spot when you're making that turn. And so this will make it a little bit easier. Um, and I also have a letter, which didn't make it in time for the public hearing, but I wouldn't mind reading it from one of the owners of the property down there. And I don't know if this would be time or after. Is there any uh, opposition to that? Reading the letter to support that wasn't in the record. It was received after the 72 hour deadline, then you need to waive the, your rules of procedure to accept that. If this was read by a counselor, like I would expect, okay. The communication you received. So th there is a question on the table, you know, would the um, council feel safe waiving the rules of procedure or feel to hear a letter in support? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Are, thank you. There are two letters, one from the Traffic Commission, which came to the minutes, which we did receive, but it was emailed to us late, and then one from the owner of Tony's Variety, but do we need a second motion to read the second one, or? We already waived the motion. Okay. We have the rules of procedure for late summons. Okay, so we got the email from Bob Ryan, the chairman of the Traffic Commission. Um, we received this uh, 2.30 today. I'm emailing in support of the proposed ordinance of no parking within 39 feet of Grove Street on Washington Street. Please be advised that the order was unanimously recommended by the Gloucester Traffic Commission members at its meeting held on July 25th, 2024. So whether we have on the record now, we all have heard that. And the other one is an email from Ravi Kumar. He lives at 184 Washington Street. He also is the owner of Tony's Variety. My name is Ravi Kumar. My wife and I live at 184 Washington Street. We own Tony's Variety at 183 Washington Street. We have a perfect view of this unsafe, very unsafe intersection and appreciate the City Council's efforts to make this area safer. Of all people who might have an objection to this proposed change, I fully support the removal of this parking spot directly in front of my store. If someone is negatively impacted, I'm sorry, if somehow it negatively impacts my business, I'm okay with the fact that my customers, my neighbors, my family will be safer. If there's a car parked in this spot, it makes it very difficult for drivers to see people who are walking in the crosswalk to cross Washington Street and making it illegal to park there, which should help. I say this, however, no amount of changes will make any difference without police enforcement of the parking rules. If there's a way to increase police enforcement of the parking regulations, that would go a long way to help make this busy intersection safer. That said, I fully support this proposed change currently before the City Council. Any questions, please feel free to contact me. So we don't control enforcement, but I think it's just helpful for us, to, sorry, to say my part, which is that we need to ask the police to also enforce these ordinances. Excellent. So I'm good. Thank and you. Thank you, Council Worthley. Is there anybody else that would like to speak in support of this? All right. Uh, Council Majota. Um, just, I support this. I think Council Worthley talked about this, I think, in the previous one, and it is a very busy intersection. Intersection, anything they would do to make it safer is great, so thank you. Uh, is there anybody like to speak in opposition? Uh, has there been any communications, Madam Clerk? I did not receive any communications. Is there any questions from counselors? Is there any one? There's no one on. Uh, so is there any questions from counselors to applicants or staff? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and ask for the committee report. 
Any recommendation on a motion by Council Marjota, second by Council Grace, that ordinance and administration committee voted three in favor, zero opposed to recommend that the City Council amend GCO Chapter 22 Traffic and Motor Vehicles, Article 6, Traffic Schedules, Section 22 through 270, Parking Prohibited at All Times, and Section 22 through 291, Toe Away Zones, by adding Washington Street from a point beginning at its intersection with Grove Street in a southerly direction for a distance of 39 feet. And I so move. Second. All right. Is there any discussion? For the measurement, correct? Or not the measurement, feet. the direction. You amended that, correct? I believe it's all been taken yeah. care of. Yes. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Council Gilman. So I will be supporting this. First of all, I want to thank Council Grow for having brought up the recommendation that we always have a map so we can visualize it. It makes it so much easier for us to know what's going on. So thank you. And um, thank you for um, both of you for initiating this um that's a crazy intersection all your reasons are really important keeping that crosswalk free from cars being too close the blind section and uh, having received the enforcement or the support of the traffic commission as well as the owner of the variety so i will be supporting it and i thank you for bringing this forward thank you thank you council Gilman. any other discussion all right. I just, I just like to say, oh, sorry. No, I'm ready to vote. I just like to say we're uh, <laughs> we seem to be fixing this intersection one spot at a time. <laughs> That's right. Doing it. So for rotary in there. <laughs> uh, with that being said, uh, I'll call for the roll. Uh, all in favor. Aye. 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 All opposed. The ayes have it. Thank you, Council Worthley, and thank you, Council Grace. Council Norman. Uh, Next up, Madam Clerk. For council vote, the decision to adopt SCP 2024 number five, Leonard Street number 36, map 121, lot 14, GZO, section 2.3.6, other principal uses, subsection four, arts, crafts, and sale of arts or crafts if made on the premises in the R20 district. I make a motion. Uh, I'm going to move the adoption of the decision of the special council permit, special council permit 2024 005 London Street number 36, map 121, lot 14, GZO 2.3.6, other principal uses, subsection 4, arts, crafts, and sale of arts and crafts or crafts if made on the premises in the R20 district. And I so move. Second. Okay. All right. And I believe this is by roll call vote. It is. Um, Councillor Grace. Aye. Councillor Grow. Aye. Councillor Majota. Yes. Councillor Memhard. Aye. Councillor Nolan. Aye. Councillor Worthley. Aye. Councillor Benson. Aye. Councillor Gilman. Aye. The vote is eight in favor, zero opposed, one absent. The motion passes. All right. And next up, Madam Clerk. Councillor's requests to the mayor. Excellent. Now, this is going to start with Councillor Grace, and then each of us should know where we stand in the order after that, and they can automatically go next. I just want to reiterate to the public to please, please, please reach out to the health department if you have questions or concerns or want to get you know um, help with testing whatever it is so that we can kind of put to rest the um, scuttlebutt on Facebook and um, make it a more productive way of handling things um, and I want to give a shout out to Element Care um, also known as PACE and to encourage people in this community if you have seniors or are a senior who are struggling um, if you qualify financially for this program it is extraordinary what they do for the elders in this town um, from 100% health care on down to doing their laundry for them to help them to age gracefully in place and to remain as healthy as long as possible. Um, can't shout out enough about how wonderful this program is. Um, thanks to the DPW for moving the crosswalk sign at the bottom of Commonwealth Ave to be actually on the crosswalk instead of after it. Helps a lot. Um, I would still like to get bus stop signs in that area for safety for the children. Um, and some clarification on the request from the last meeting about school zone signs on Centennial Ave, specifically in the Newell Stadium area that is school property. 
Um, and if we could make it, you know, a bona fide school zone with signs, at least for a portion of every day, the speed limit would be 20 miles an hour and perhaps safer. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Council Grace. Council Grove. I don't want to uh, jump the gun on this, but I just want to uh, wish our colleague, uh, Council President Tony Gross, uh, a quick recovery. I'm hoping that uh, third or fourth time's the charm and that uh, he's going to be out here dancing in front of us very shortly. So, Tony, get better quick. Um, though, Here. to be honest with you, uh, you've been doing such a great job that... <clears throat> anyway, the other thing I'd like to say is that um, if you weren't there on Sunday night and because of Hunger Awareness Month, the uh, Open Door had its, uh, in second glance, had its first ever thrift uh, show um, event, and uh, it was amazing. It was sold out of the cut. Uh, when people think about thrift clothes, thrift, thrift shopping, we don't often think about Gucci skirts and uh, Gloria Vanderbilt and all this, but those were the kinds of fa fashions that were on display. These are things that are they're donated at second glance on a regular basis. So um, if you, uh, you want to look cool and look awesome, go to second glance and, and, and get yourself kitted out. But the, but the importance of the event, as it's already been pointed out, Hunger Awareness Month and the, um, the sort of chilling reminder that, that uh, need in this community especially is going up. It's, it's actually surpassing what was uh, happening during COVID. Um, there are a number of factors for that, but it is something that is a real issue in our community. So uh, as, as Councillor uh, uh, Nolan said earlier, anything you can do to, to make yourself aware of this and, and contribute to being um, helpful towards solving this pro excuse me, problem uh, would be greatly uh, appreciated by your friends and neighbors, because I, I guarantee you that you know someone who is, is receiving help from the open door. Uh, it is gladly given, freely given, and um, uh, it's an important resource in this community. So um, thank you. Thank you all for participating with the Orange. Thank you, Councilor Grow. Councilor Gilman. No? I'm not after Grow. I am I. That's before Grow. So I'm at the end. Oh. I was doing the alphabet. Next is Councilor Majota. Yes. <laughs> A Oh, uh, Councillor Grow um, said a great thing about the open door and second glance, so um, thank you for saying all that. And um, all my requests to the mayor have been emailed, and I am just waiting for an answer or two on that. Thank you. <laughs> well, Memhart. I would just like to take this moment to uh, congratulate all of us, from the administration to Maritime Gloucester, to the offshore schooner community, to celebrate our Gloucester Schooner Festival. It was just a spectacular long weekend over Labor Day. And, uh, you know, what, what a gift to see all those sails in the harbor and out around the breakwater. And it was just a huge event. I, I'm sure it had a traumatic effect in terms of income and sales and visitors to the, econ to the local economy. But it's just, it's something that's so special and it's such a celebration. And it has so many lasting photographs and memories. So it's just congratulations to all of us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Council Member. Council Worthley. No, you don't. I go last. Um, so I was really impressed with the presentation tonight. So grateful to the Board of Health and the staff and the mayor uh, for bringing that to us. Um, so I'm organizing a cleanup event on September 28th. It's a Saturday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., starting at Gloucester High School. Um, and we've had up to 90 people at this before, so I'm trying to see if we, it'd be great if we all could be there and, and lend a hand if you're in town, um, if you're not. Um, but just an hour of help goes a long way. Um, also that day, though, there is the Community Impact Unit is doing their safety day starting at 11 at Harbor Loop, so maybe you can get to my cleanup event and then get to that event as well. Um, the first week of school was a big success. I know my kids loved it and everyone's safer. I think that we, we should be driving carefully and slower um, in general. Um, I want to request the mayor to create a mechanism. I'm not sure exactly how to, how to do this, but we did the tour of the police station maybe about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And the builders, the building, representative of the building team said, it's really good to wait a year before you make any adjustments because you got to go through all the seasons. And I appreciate that, uh, you know, the cooling and the heating, but also there's a warranty. I think it's a, a one year warranty. So 
if, um, if this project is looking at one, as one project, courthouse, the police station, then we have time. If it's separated into two projects, police stations, parts done, that clock is ticking. And I'm aware of a couple of things that have been brought to my attention from people who work in the building that are concerns. That'd be great to be able to create a punch list to have it still accountable to the contract we have with the builder. I'm not sure what that mechanism is. I don't know if the city council has a role in that necessarily, but I just want to encourage the mayor to, um, and I'd be happy to help with this, but to have a mechanism where police and staff can say, this isn't working right, this isn't working right, and not wait till a year later, and then we have to spend more money um, on that. So um, that's that. And then I just want to also lastly uh, thank Councilor Crow and Margiota for their work with the open door and your kind words. Um, my grandfather used to say when he was a kid, he would come home from school and not ask if there's dinner. I'm sorry, what's for dinner, but is there dinner? And um, I have great empathy for that. And I, th I think you said we all know someone who has benefited from open door. And I'm happy. To, it's, you know, there's some pride in it, too. But I'm happy to say I had benefited from it in the past. And not only did I, it help me and my family with food, it became a new family. Uh, in the sense of how easy it was to um, take advantage of that benefit. And as much as we say we know someone who benefits from it, we also know someone who could benefit from it, that might have a stigma, be unsure about whether it's you know okay to go. Um, I think the open door has always been open and welcoming. I just want to reinforce that if you're in that population of people who might not qualify for benefits, EBT or food stamps or things like that, but you're still struggling to put food on the table, the open door is there for you too. And certainly, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no um, necessary financial check on if you need food, you need food. And they've been extremely generous and kind. And I just want to thank them and encourage people to use the service. So um, that's it for me. Thank, thank you, you. Councilor Worthley. Councilor Benson. Um, yes, I will first say um as someone who used the open door as a youth and and having to think about rent versus food and so many so many out here and i remember growing up sometimes my dad having to choose between rent and food and we still have such a need here in this community one in six are food insecure and i sympathize greatly with those that are dealing with food insecurity as i have lived that and i continue to um believe very strongly in doing whatever we can as a city government and as a community to continue to improve the lives of the people we serve. And um, lastly, I also will say, speak, speak um, just for some requests um, to the mayor is getting a swing repaired at Burnham's Field. It's a, um, an accessible swing. And I think as we just saw during the um, Olympic uh, during the Paralympic Games, um, speaking about more inclusivity in our community and inclusion. And I think we can continue to advance our community around enhancing accessibility in our built environment, including sidewalks, green space, and public parks and beaches. And I commend the administration recently for expanding access to our beaches. And I think we collectively need to continue to do more for accessibility in this community. Um, that is all I have. And I also just want to give a shout out to the clerk's office for their preliminary election. Um, very well done on that and um, being the, the safeguard of democracy. So thank you for all your work on that. And I know you're going to be very busy coming up in the coming months. So thank you. Thank you, Council Benson. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Gilman. Thank you, Councilor President. So I just have two very quick things. The first is just a reminder that the Blackburn Brew Fest is on September 21st at Stage 4 Park. If you had your tickets for last year and it was canceled, um, you get a rain check. So you should have heard from that about a month ago. And if you haven't, go down to the chamber and they'll work through it with you and ask you to validate that you were there. Um, so that's it's a great event, it's a lot of fun, great music, and um, I think it was very well attended two years ago before 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is um, one of the things on the agenda tonight was the, um, out of BNF, was the comprehensive financial report for 2023. And um, it, it, as Council Memard stated, it is a very helpful way to look at all the good things the city has done. So my suggestion is that in a request to the mayor is I'd love to see it posted in some place other than just the auditor's section. No offense to Kenny, it should always be there. That's where it, it stands. But I'd love to see it either front, more front and center on the city website, maybe in the, the latest news um, with a link to where it needs to be. But if you wanna get a good feeling about all the things the city does for us every year, it's like a hidden paycheck. And too often people on social media are saying all the bad things about the city and there are some really positive things. So I encourage you to read it, have everyone out that's listening to this meeting read it. And my request is to see if we could get it more front and center so the public can just get it pushed out to us a little bit more because it's, it's really a feel good thing. So with, the, with that being said, that's all I have to say. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor <laughs> Gilman, and here, here for our auditor's department. All right, so I'm gonna start mine off with an apology. Um, we had a nice meeting tonight, but I did forget, however, to announce our clerk, Grace Poirier, and our assistant clerk, Danielle Argentino, and I'm sorry about that, in, in part because they handed me the list of who was online <laughs> and who was there, and they excluded themselves, and I overlooked it, and I feel really bad about it because you guys are very important to us. So um, with that being said, I am looking for a motion to oh, adjourn. Oh, second. Can okay. I make second. one adjustment to something I said? I made a mistake. That's oh, so Sorry. The cleanup event on 928 Saturday is anything a mistake. It's at, starting at Gloucester High School. This is the third time we've done it. But we started at Burnham's Field the first two years. It's just because of the number of cars we have. It's just easier to do that at the high school. Um, James Cook was very kind to give me permission to do that. And if you do come, don't park near the field, the, the, sorry, the Newell Stadium, because there's a JV football game happening. So hoping people will pull up to the other side, closer to the vocational school. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Excellent. So do we have a motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank and you. Have a great night.